Hello, welcome to a Zoomy Zoom. This is Paul, the Ripples guy, hanging out with a whole bunch of members of the Team Ripples Patreon community, folks who pitch in a few dollars every month to help us unleash all these Ripley shenanigans, and a whole bunch of our guests that are joining us. We have, oh my gosh, we have a whole bunch of folks in the room live with us, and it's also true that we have people that might be listening in another time on the YouTube video. We're going to load this. We're going to put it on social media. And you may all also be listening to the Ripples podcast. And however you are with me live or in the future or in, my, in your past, I'm in your past, I'm so <laughs> glad to be with you today. We have an ambitious schedule I want to see, we are up to 70 people. We are approaching a record for our monthly Zoom times, and it is a great honor to be with you. We have an ambitious uh, program, and I want you to know that um, I am a human being, giving this for the second time now. I am also b a biased human being. I have uh, very strong political views. Uh, I sometimes think other people uh, people on the other side are looking at things wrong. I often think that people on my side are treating other people wrong and are looking at things wrong. I'm probably one of the more partisan people who can fight with my side as much as I fight with the other <laughs> side. And um, we're going to figure out how to get through this together this afternoon. I do need to take a couple deep breaths to bring my best self to this. So I'm gonna take a couple deep breaths and think here on the inhale and now on the exhale. And I wanna start with a quote from poet Amanda Gorman that some of us got to know in January of 2021, but in April of 2020, she wrote a poem about the, uh, the early days of the pandemic. And a small part of it said, while we might feel small, separate, and all alone, our people have never been more closely tethered. The question isn't if we will weather this unknown, but how we will weather the unknown together. And there is Nothing like reading a quote from Amanda Gorman and hearing her read it in your ears and knowing you're not doing it justice. <laughs> she would, she's amazing at reading poetry. <laughs> um, but I want to start there. And I want to start with the fact that there is no option other than weathering the storm that we're in together. We think about vanquishing the other side. And in the finite game of election year and some aspects of politics, and how we look at the media and in the news and how we think about our culture. It's win-lose, we gotta win, we wanna win. We wanna defeat this. In the infinite game of humanity, there is no moving forward without all of us. And what I wanna do today is show you the possibilities that exist. Most of you watching know the Ripple's emails we send out We've been sending out for over 25 years, yay. Um, and we have a pebble and a boulder and a ponder every Monday, two quotes and something to think about for the week. We do pebble, boulder, ponder as the structure of our Zooms. And the pebble is a resource uh, that I'm using either in my life or in my work as a, as a presenter. And what, what I have up first, our resource for today is this little um, postcard. And if you're listening to the podcast or if you can't easily see the screen, I've got a, a postcard that's got two images on it. One is a little pug all snug in bed um, below the words, seek comfort. And then there's a wacky squirrel climbing up some flowers under the banner, seek challenge. And I picked this up way back in grad school when I had was getting my master's in higher ed. And this guy, Nevid Sanford, talked about the importance of challenge and support in creating learning environments for college students. And I'm a big believer, whether we're talking about college, any learning environment, any working environment, any life environment, that we can't do our best learning and growing unless we have the right balance between comfort and challenge. 
And the big problem is we don't naturally seek out a balance. We have a self-preservation instinct that knows that comfort is more likely to keep us alive than, than too much challenge. So we go into this with a bias towards comfort. I want us today, I am promised, I am committed to making sure that as many of you as possible end our time together with more comfort. I believe that hope is not only a good option, I think it's essential, and I think it's really easy to see some ways in, in there is real hope. I also want you leaving here with choices and options in how to think and how to feel and how to, and how to do better so that you and the people around you um, can feel more hopeful and, and be more proactive in things. I'm also going to challenge you. And I want to um, I want to challenge some of the conclusions you've reached, some of the assumptions you've made, and some of the choices that you might be making in how you think and feel uh, and act. I promise you, I am not interested in challenging your beliefs, your values, even your most strongly held beliefs. I am 100% okay with you starting here feeling really strongly about some things and ending here. But I am going to challenge you about some things, and discomfort is required for growth. You cannot remain comfortable and grow into the best possible version of yourself. And so please remember, there's going to be times when you're like, mm-mm, Paul, uh-uh, you just crossed the line. And if, I, if you don't have that even once, then I'm not doing my job. Again, you do not have to agree with me. I'm going to be wrong about some stuff today. I'm sure of it. We're going to have different ways of looking at things and... The world gets better every time we can listen, acknowledge, and then find a way to present an, a, a view while, while retaining the humanity of the person that you're, that you're disagreeing passionately with. The, so that was the pebble. The boulder in our Zooms is an activity that I'm using either personally or professionally. And our boulder today actually also comes from my work. It's two stickers. Um, some of you might know both of them, but I know a lot of you know that second one. The first one is a little sticker that's just a smiley face that has around the edge the words, think better with an arrow towards feel better with an arrow towards do better. And I originally created this design for a presentation on uh, emotional well-being. And it's based on the idea that when you go and, and um, decide to go into counseling, most counseling programs uh, take a look at, or excuse me, most counseling models approach mental and emotional well-being from one or two of these three areas. It's true that if you think better, you feel better, you do better. Cognitive therapy really says, hey, if we can get looking at some of the distorted thinking you have and we tweak how you think, you're going to feel better, you're going to do better. Behavioral-based therapy says, let's get you doing these things, and I promise if you do these and, and we figure out the right things for you, you're going to think better and feel better. And there's plenty of times where what some of us think of as traditional counseling, sitting down and somebody saying, somebody you trust and somebody you respect, how are you feeling? And how are you feeling about how you're feeling? Well, this sticker was sitting on my desk as I planned this presentation a few weeks ago, and it occurred to me that it's a great way for us to set up our content. So when we get to the, hey, what do we need to be doing differently? We're going to first talk about what is polarization, how did we get there? But then I'm going to explore, think better, some ways for you to think better, for ways to feel better, and, and some ways to do better. And the second sticker says, we got this, and it is four years um, it is four years old this week, if you can believe it. The first week of the pandemic of lockdown, uh, a few of us got together and said, we got this if we come together and have four things. Curious minds, open hearts, and calm spirits while you nurture your health. And again, this was sitting on my desk. And as I was working on the do better part of the presentation, it occurred to me that Activating our curious minds and open hearts and calm spirits is a perfect way to frame the, the suggestions I have for you in terms of activities and nurturing your health. When we originally created the sticker, it was wash your hands, throw on a mask, social distance. 
it quickly became resilience content dealing with challenge and change where nurturing your health was, yes, your physical health, also your emotional health and your spiritual health. In this context, the end of our time together, we're going to be talking about our own health, our relationship health, and our community health. And so now you have some treats, and I will tell you that these two stickers and this postcard fit perfectly into a number 10 envelope. And if you have a moment at the end of our time together to fill out a quick eval to let me know what you liked and what you can go, I would love to throw a stamp on that and send you some treats. Importantly, before we dive into our topic, I have a very important question to, to, for, to, for you to answer. It's a cloudy to decent day, no rain, no snow, the weather is good, the, the traffic is not very bad, and you have to hop on the interstate with a 65 mile an hour speed limit, and you've got to drive 65 miles. What's the speed limit? What's the, what do you put your cruise control on, or what are you going to drive? I would love it if you head over to the chat. Oh, look at you all figuring out exactly what I want. I, um, Jennifer started with 68. We've got 74. We got 68, 67. So you all are on, on average so far, you're slower than, than the Tuesday night crowd. Okay. There's 74, 71, 72, 65, 70, 70. This is fascinating. We had an 82. We had, to, we had a bunch of upper seventies last night. This is fascinating. Here is what I need you to realize. You pick a speed and you know it's the right speed. And when you get on the interstate, we have this really strong tendency. When someone zooms past us, idiot, that person is not valuing my safety or the safety of the other people. And the person that you come up on that's going slower than you, oh, oh what are you doing? <laughs> Hello. And here's the trickier part. The speed that you choose may have some rationale behind it. But how many times have you just been in a mood either either because you're late or or because you got the right music on and suddenly you're going a lot faster? <laughs> you have cruise control set, but it's your foot on the gas pedal and you're wondering why everyone is driving so slow. And then you realize you're going 85 <laughs> <laughs> or you're having a wonderful day and everything's good. And you're just la 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 la. And you're like, why is everyone a complete jerk today? And you discover you're going 65. I have been in both of those situations many times. It doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you a human being driving at a speed in which everyone going faster than you is not going your speed. And there's a tendency to judge them. And everyone going slower than you is going a different speed. And there's a tendency to judge them as well. And what ends up happening is Oh, somebody's, got, sorry, I, I, Deshaun's got her sticker up on her bulletin board, and that just totally made me my day. Love it. Our tendency when, when somebody is driving a different speed than us, when somebody is, um, when somebody arrives earlier for me than a party, they're too eager. When someone arrives later than me, they're just inconsiderate. When someone spends more time on social media, I might conclude that they're addicted. If they don't spend as much time as me, they're, they might be out of touch. If somebody is meaner than me, they're an uncivil person. If they're, if they're just a lot nicer than me, well, then they're not being sincere. If they're more sensitive than I am, they're a fragile fa flower. If they're less sensitive than I am, well, then they're a cold jerk. If they're less into politics than I am, they're just being unpatriotic. They don't care about their country. And if they're more into politics, looking at you, Max, then they're just a fanatic. And they're just that's just ridiculous, too. Um, if somebody puts their takes their... Christmas decorations down earlier than me, then they're underappreciating the holiday. And if they've taken down later than me, then they're overdoing it and they are taking away from the sacredness. Christmas belongs in December, everybody knows. Oh, whoops, soapbox, apologize. How often when somebody is on the other side about something, do we assume they're stupid or they're crazy? And when I use the word crazy, I know that's a hard word for some people. I'm talking about irrational, not talking about mental illness. How often do we say, oh, they're just crazy. And they're talking about, they have to be irrational to have that view or they're evil. And you might be right, but I'll tell you, there's different words we sometimes use. And we're gonna talk about um, empathic conjugation, emotive conjugation a little bit later. It might be that the person is uninformed or thinking irrational or uncaring. 
but I'll tell you how we judge them in terms of how strongly the negative words we use to describe their lack of uh, understanding of a, of a situ or their irrational thinking um, or their their lack of compassion for a group or for a person or for a cause. But another term we're going to learn today is the idea that it is possible to absolutely believe that somebody is wrong, but believe that a reasonable person could reach that conclusion without being stupid or crazy or evil. And that is where we get into trouble. And that is also our opportunity for growth if we have a growth mindset about all of this stuff. Polarization is a thing. And I want to make a quick distinction that ideological polarization is the idea that when we have an issue, that we often have people that are on, on one side about an issue and on another, and that especially when they get together and talk to each other, they tend to polarize and get more strongly held in their beliefs. Ideological polarization has always existed and probably will always exist. There is no fixing it. There is no need to fix it. I believe if, if we just look at, at sort of the liberal left-leaning to right-leaning conservative, that is going to, that has happened since forever. It is probably going to happen for as long as humans are around. The idea that we can vanquish the other side is unhealthy. It is problematic and it is a delusion because we're all in this boat together. And if you imagine a bunch of us are in a rowboat and we're standing up and somebody is leaning right, then somebody's gonna lean left or the boat's gonna tip over. And, and that's normal. The problem is some people started leaning left a little bit more and then some people leaned right a little bit more. And, and in a way, if, if one group stopped right now, the boat would tip over. So everyone thinks, well, it can't be me that stops leaning. They got to stop leaning, but then I'll stop leaning. But the reality is if this idea, if we get rid of the people leaning the other way, that's we, that we're all going to be okay and safe. No, we're going to drown where the boat's going to be. The boat's going to be gone because this is the humanity we have. This is the world we have. I'm not talking about ideological polarization. I'm not talking about how much we disagree about abortion, about um, gay marriage, about immigration. I'm talking about how much we hate each other when somebody's on the other side. And that is affective polarization or toxic polarization. And that has increased radically. The number of people who believe who use words like deranged to talk about the other side who who unstable who talk about um in extremely negative ways uh un, the 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 ability to trust and respect the other side ha, has fallen precipitously and is continuing to decline and is things are going to get worse before they get better unless every we wa make everyone watch this presentation a big cause of that is the distorted perceptions we have of the other side. And there's some fascinating research that organizations are going on that proves pretty strongly that our perception of the other side does not always mirror reality. And our perceptions of their perceptions of us are also distorted. And as long as we are both sides, as long as we are looking at, at things through a distorted lens and, and making assumptions about the other side that are inaccurate, it's just going to make this polarization work. Look, there are people in this room right now, excuse me, I got to reset my, I got my 10 minute timer to keep me moving on some of this. Um, there are people in this room right now that whose full-time work is in politics, people that I love, people that I respect tremendously. I have people in my life that work full-time in the media that I trust and respect tremendously. And I also have, especially my buddies out at Cal Poly, I have a lot of former Cal Poly students who work in social media industry and in, in, uh, for Meta and for LinkedIn and, and um, whatever we're calling Twitter this week, X. X. Um, so I'm not interested in saying that these people are bad because you know what? Most of them aren't. I will say for the purposes of this discussion that affective polarization is being amplified to some degree by how politics is working. And I will just quickly point to two things, not the only two things, but two things I think that are contributing particularly in politics. And one is up until the early 80s uh, if in, in our country, if you got elected to Congress, if you got elected to the Senate, 
you are moving to Washington. You are moving your spouse, which in most of the team, this was a guy moving his wife and kids, and they were going to Washington. They were putting their kids in school there. They were living in neighborhoods where some of their neighbors were their party and some of the neighbors were opposite parties. They spent a lot of time together outside. Did they disagree? Absolutely. Were they name calling? For sure. And then they had to go to their kids' recital. And then there was a dinner party where half the guests were their party and half the guests were the other party. And they were forced to spend time together and remembering the humanity of each other so they could fight like the Dickens. They could get quoted as just saying awful things to each other in a floor speech. And then they could go grab a beer and then they could talk a little bit. And that at, at, somewhere in the I believe it was in the early to late 80s, it started more and more people started saying, if my person's in Washington, they're out of touch. And so it became out of fashion for our people to actually have a house there. Most of them now, they share an apartment with three or four of their colleagues. They're there during the week and they scoot back home. Their families are here and it becomes harder for them to remember the humanity. The other thing that's true is how we draw uh, legislative districts in our country is very broken. And again, so many other things to talk about, but I will tell you that there was a time when lots and lots of our congressional districts um, could go either Democrat or Republican, depending on the candidate, depending on what's going on in the country, depending on what's going on in a state and in a region. And if somebody got elected to Congress, in order to get reelected, they were almost certainly going to have to get um, the votes of a fair number of moderates and at least a few people who usually vote on the other side. And I believe the number, it's, it's over 80 percent of congressional districts now are safe and, and they are either solidly red or solidly blue. So it is in the primary, which brings out much more partisan politics, which brings out only the super party faithful, where people have to stand up and say the most conservative thing or the most progressive thing. And it becomes, um, and, and during the time right now, we live in an era where working together is seen as a sign that you're working with the enemy. And so there isn't a lot of pressure for them to sit down and work together. The same media, is made with a whole bunch of good people trying to help us stay informed and also um, make a living. And as when most people in our country spent time watching the news and reading a newspaper, there was only a few options to choose from and most people were gonna watch one of them. So it was fairly easy to throw on a PNG commercial and, and, and that would pay for the advertising and you could have three different people delivering the news slightly differently. But since some of your viewers were Republican and some of them were Democrats, then we kind of had to make sure we were at least trying to be equal about it. Same thing with newspapers, that's no longer the case. And so we've got fewer and fewer people spending time on the news, more and more people trying to grab their eyeballs. The easiest way to grab their eyeballs, scare the bejesus out of them or piss them off really bad. And as a result, you get headlines that have really strong words and you have um, a lot of people that are spending a lot of time trying to stay informed that are ended up getting frustrated and, and, and or scared. And finally, social media. We thought it was gonna bring us together when they started measuring how do we get people to spend more time on social media, we discovered that when they were pissed off, they were more likely to ah, than they were like, oh, let me tell you about the breakfast I had. And oh, let me tell you about the sunset I had. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we are as much to blame as the people. We, it's so easy to blame the social media, but the re reality is we're kind of addicted to outrage. Our system evolved to pay attention more to things that scare us and frustrate us, it kept us alive. And one of the books we're gonna talk about is in the 200,000 years um, that humans have been on the planet, if you imagine that as a thousand page book, every page is about 250 years of time, the whole of American history is on page 1000. And recorded history is only in the last 50 page of that 100,000. And the advances in technology that are that are here and among us, our brains aren't ready to handle yet. Yet, growth mindset. Um, and so, what do we do about all of this? Well, we need to think better, we need to feel better, and we need to do better. And when I say feel better, I'll I'll give you a heads up that what I mean. I, I I want you to feel better, but I also want you to manage your emotions, emotional regulation. I want 
you and me and all of us to be a little bit better at regulating our emotions when, when we dive into this. Can I quickly um, take a sip of water and introduce you to a, a concept that I picked up? Tim Urban, you might know his name. Uh, Wait But Why is his blog. He draws little um, simple drawings and a lot of people follow him. He worked for, I believe, six years on this book that he put out. It's only available electronically. I believe that's still true. And it's called What's Our Problem? A Self-Help Book for Societies. And a central tenet of his book that I think is going to be useful for us as we think about this is that this idea of a ladder, he talks about our the two brains that we have, a higher mind that is um, rational and into thinking and a primitive mind that is a little bit more based in, in fear and frustration and survival and how he identified four different levels. And he uses terms to talk about some people are this and some people are that. I think it is far more useful and far more accurate to talk about these as energies or modes that all of us are in. The upper two rungs, the higher mind is most in control. The my, higher, man, higher mind has the edge, but is not completely in control. There's a little bit of primitive thinking. And then the lower two rungs, one, the primitive mind has the edge. There's still a little bit of, of higher thinking. And then the primitive mind is completely in control. And the labels he uses is scientist, sports fan, attorney, and zealot. <laughs> and again, not saying any of these, like literally attorneys are bad. No, no, no. He's talking about a specific role that attorneys take, defense attorneys in a courtroom. Um, but a scientist, higher rung thinking is looking, turning to colleagues and saying, can you help me? Can you try to prove this wrong? Can you really see what are the holes in this argument? I want this to be right, so I'm willing to be wrong. Uh, sports fans, they want their team to win, but they're not going to be as excited if if they know the game is fixed or if the referee is completely you know on their side. They want things to be fair, and they're probably going to be okay if there's a few calls that are for their side that maybe if we watch the replay, it's not right. They're going to be okay with that because there's a little bit of that primitive, like us, we got to win and they're bad. The attorney mindset, and again, don't think like all lawyers are, are, are primitive thinkers. It's an attorney's job in a courtroom is to bring all the evidence they can that would demonstrate their clients innocent and not shine as strong a light on the evidence that might, uh, ma might make their client appear guilty. They'd they're ethically bound and 99% and of them, they don't want to break the law. They don't want to break the rules, but they're also not going to go out of their way to bring forth evidence that might cast doubt on, on the innocence of their client. And then the most um, primitive brain is the zealot mode. And this, these are folks who, who, who hate the other side. Violence is okay. We need to banish all thought and thinking that is, that is on the other side. And there is no redeeming quality of people um, um, or the ideas from the other side. I throw this out there just to give us some groundwork when I, you'll hear me talk about higher thinking and lower thinking. And I want you to be, I want you to remember that it might, your tendency might be to think of people that, oh, I know somebody who's a zealot. I don't think that's as valuable as saying, when am I in some of these lower rungs? When am I, um, what things have I done that have helped pull me up into higher thinking about some of this? And then we move into the other piece about thinking better. And again, I'm a little embarrassed that I didn't think of this idea. It sort of came to me, but I told you I had this, this here now, sorry, this uh, think better, feel better, do better sticker on my desk. It gave me the organizing principle for this presentation. I had taken notes literally as far back as 2016. I've been pulling together. I have a couple documents where I've been like, if I ever talk about this, I want to talk about this and this and this and this. And here's, I had, I found like eight Facebook posts that I never even posted because I would start typing like this. Mm -hmm. And then by the end, it was like, this. <laughs> if you don't agree with me, then I'm like, oh, it's not time set aside. Never got posted. So I, 
I started putting all some of these points that I wanted to make, and I was putting them into cal- categories, think better, feel better, do better. And it shocked me when I sat down a week and a half, two weeks ago to look at my list of think better examples. And they were using words that I remembered I actually use in the think better, feel better, do better workshops, because in the think better section, we talk about cognitive distortions. And if you don't, if you, that term is new to you, make a note to Google it later. There's great articles. And I will tell you, most of us can benefit from spending 10 minutes reading an article that talks about some people have a list of 10. I think some lists are longer, like 20 or 22 cognitive distinctions that very often get us into trouble. And sometimes it, we're, we're so busy feeling bad that we don't notice it's actually our distorted thinking that is at the root of it and tweaking our thinking helps us feel better and ultimately do better. I'm just gonna highlight a couple, but one of the notes that I have available for you is a little PDF of this sheet that I'm looking at right now. It is, um, has the, I think I put 10 distortions on here. I've got the list nine, it might be nine on my list. And then the definitions of them. And then the examples that I found that are more in the area of, of effective polarization. But the obvious couple first ones, all or nothing thinking. How often do you hear some version of, it's as simple as this, either you value women or you don't. Either you think children are worth saving or you don't. There's either you support your LGBTQ kid or you don't. There's no middle ground in this. Here's the problem. It's not accurate. It's not helpful around the issue of abortion, one of the most divisive issues we have. And I don't have a middle of the road opinion about this. I have very strong opinions that lean one way or the other. But anyone who tries to say to me, it's as simple as you either value women or you don't, ignores the fact that roughly 44% of this country is okay with a general ban on abortions and if you look at the number of people in our country who believe that there should be no abortions allowed, regardless of cause, it's like five people. No, that's not true. It's a very small percentage of people. The number of people in this country, even if you look closely at the liberal side of things, that think that there should be abortions from conception to the day that a baby is born, you will not find very many people. There are people who believe that life begins at conception that also support making exceptions. There are people who say, I absolutely think that part of reproductive health for women is making abortions available to a certain point. And the reality is when we fuel all or nothing thinking, we make things better in the short term. We make it clear. All you have to do is decide, do you believe this or not? Do you care about this person or don't you? Then this is the way to vote. Then this is what you do. It makes it in the short term a little easier. And in the long term, it messes things up horribly. Overgeneralizing. How often do we see something, we hear something that somebody on the other side has said, and we assume that's what everyone on that side believes? Anyone who would vote for that candidate must believe everything that person has said. I saw an interesting statistic. They anal- uh, One of the groups that I get a lot of mail from starts with us and Braver Angels are two organizations I'm going to be talking about. Starts with us, um, did a review of news coverage of the 2022 congressional candidates and found out that the ones, that the candidates that were hyper-partisan got approximately four times as much media coverage as the ones who are more either middle of the road in terms of their views or are talk openly about bipartisanship and working together and, and, and open to compromise. And so all of us who consume the news, we get this distorted view of what just our elected officials are saying and thinking um, and feeling and doing on these issues. And then we, we, we overgeneralize. We filter out bad, good news about the other side and we only focus on the bad and we do the same with our team. We are much more likely to say, see, look at all that good stuff they're doing. And then something bad, they say, we either, we either don't focus on it all or we say, well, they were just having a bad day. And the list goes on, but so does the time. So excuse me if I keep us moving. That's thinking better. And 
thinking better is a skill. And with all of this, with skills, you can practice and you can get better. You do not have to give up your uh, tightly held beliefs. You do not have to like the people on the other side. When we sacrifice the respect and the trust uh, and, and have no room for positive regard, that's where we're getting dangerous. And this last one on the bottom, it says emotional reasoning. Listen, I am a strong Myers-Briggs F. I value my emotions and my emotions come into play when I'm making decisions. Emotional reasoning is a cognitive distortion. And that's when we use feelings to justify our thinking. I'm mad at this person. Therefore, they must be a bad person. I am afraid of what might happen. And therefore, something is dangerous. And that is a very common thing that is happening where we are having big feels and we are reaching conclusions that may not be accurate because we might be having feels because something is reminding us of something else or because we don't understand something well. And so that is going to take us into the feel better, managing our emotions differently. And if you're watching, you'll see over my shoulder here, we've got an image from Disney's uh, Inside Out, which I love that movie. And the five feelings that they, the movie, well, if you're not familiar, uh, takes place in the side, inside the head of a girl for the most part. And these different emotions are characters in the movie. And there's anger and there's uh, joy and there's sadness and there's disgust. Mindy Kalin's disgust is, she's the best. And um, fear. And what we learn in that movie and what I think a lot of us know about ourselves is all of these emotions are helpful. All of these emotions have their role. What gets us into trouble is when they're in the driver's seat, when they're standing at the control uh, buttons and when they are making the decisions. Oh, yes. And Danielle says, can't wait for the next one. And it is so true that the sequel is coming out. Um, I believe it's this year, <laughs> this spring. Um, and I'm so excited. I'm so excited uh, because the movie closes with them <laughs> freaking out because puberty is about to happen to the girl. And so it sort of sets it up like, oh, they're already planning. They're already planning the next movie. Um, and I don't want to demonize any of these fields. I promise you, disgust exists for a reason. It helps keep us alive, as does anger, as does fear. When they get out of control, when they get in the driver's seat, they cause problems. And very briefly, I want to give you three things. Not very briefly, the third one we're going to spend some time on. The first one is reacting versus responding. Mm -hmm. And Reactivity is a very big problem, and, and it's one of the things that have exacerbated social media, is that we have access to see something, react to it right in the moment. Ugh! And we, uh, it's called an amygdala hijack, where our fight, flight, fear takes over, and we say something. A good sign that you get hijacked is 20 to 30 minutes after you post something, or you say something, or you do something, either if you're filled with regret or if you're filled with rationalization, well, I, I know I probably you know, could have said that differently, but that's a sign that you got hijacked and you went too far and you said something or you did something that was when you were in a state. And being able to notice, oh, I'm in reaction mode right now. I want to wait a little bit. The reason I have dozens of simple text files in one place in my computer is because I generally write my social media posts on my computer or on my phone. And they stay as drafts at first until I'm sure that I'm responding to something and I'm not reacting. Mm -hmm. And I would say 70 to 80% of never see the light of day. And I'm okay with that um, because they were reacting and not responding. Uh, I wanna make sure that I said everything about that. Oh, yes. There is a book, Talking to Crazy. And again, if the word crazy is a little triggery for you, I respect that. We're t this is written by a psychologist who is also an FBI hostage negotiator, Mark Goulston. And what he's talking about in the title, Talking to Crazy, you'll see the subtitle, How to Deal with Irrational and Impossible People in Your Life. And the bulk of this book is about research that he and others did when they realized that some FBI FBI hostage negotiators were much better than others at keeping hostages alive and keeping hostage takers alive. And so they did an in-depth study to say, what are these two groups doing differently? 
And the biggest thing they learned out of that is that hostage negotiators that keep people alive, keep more people alive, hostages and hostage takers, is when the person who is talking crazy, acting crazy, meaning irrationally, most of the time when we engage with somebody who's speaking or acting irrationally, it triggers our crazy. And we uh, ramp things up. We escalate things because their uh, is grabbing onto our uh, and then we go up and then they go up and it up, 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 up. But some negotiators, even in the face of somebody getting killed, can say, all right, you made that choice. There's four other people that we can still save. So I need to stay this calm and my volume needs to be at this level. And I still need to be willing to find a way to show some respect, to show some positive regard and to show some trust. And, and, and the other thing that they found was that it's really hard to fake those things. And so even in the face of highly irrational behavior, some FBI negotiators are able to say, I can see why he did that. I don't agree with it, but I see based on what is in his mind right now, most hostage takers are male, um, that I can see how he did that. And that is called epistemic empathy. Epistemic empathy is when you can absolutely disagree with what somebody is thinking, saying, or doing, but you can see how a reasonable person would get there depending on their life circumstances, depending on how they're looking at something. Getting out of your seat or getting out of your side of the rowboat and going over and really looking what is it like over there on the other side. And that takes time, that takes emotional labor, that takes um, trust and respect that is dwindling. So epistemic empathy, if, if your only conclusion, the people you disagree with, the only conclusion is they're stupid or crazy or evil, I don't think it's accurate. I don't think it's helpful. I understand why you get on social media and you say some of the things you do. And some of the people that I purposely asked to attend these two sessions are people that who's, who, who say things online and then there are other people people agree with them about how awful the other side is. And it, it feels like venting. It feels good. It comes, it, 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 there's a benefit to it. And it's just like when my, when I worked in higher ed for years, every homecoming, all the Greeks would have a competition about floats. And, and there would be all these, a lot of campuses, they have all these other competition, who's the best fraternity and sorority, and they're going to win, you know, prizes at homecoming. And they battle like the Dickens with each other. And a lot of the things they do bring their unit together, but don't make them, as they, they feel farther apart from the other Greeks. But then somebody comes up and somebody wants to get rid of all of Greeks and all the Greeks have to band together and say, no, we got to protect this. And if they've done too many things to fight against each other, they, it's harder to come together. Most of the time they do a little playful battling. They can still go to the homecoming game and we're all on the same page because we want to beat the other school. And then when playoffs happen and our team isn't the one that's in the playoffs, but the team that we is our battle team, but they're representing our conference, shoot, we're on their side too. <laughs> the problem is that if we do too much of this fighting, if we, if we aren't able to see the humanity, we can't then come together when the big things happen, like, I don't know, global pandemics. And the third piece of this that I really wanted to share with you is about emotive conjugation. And this is a term I first heard about in 2016. Uh, it was coined by Bertrand Russell, the philosopher, and it's never really become a common thing we talked about it. I personally don't think the term, um, all respect to Bertrand Russell, who is an amazing philosopher, uh, I don't believe the best term is emotive conjugation because I think it's really empathic conjugation, but it's the idea that, that we use different words um, to describe things. And, and when I was talking about stupid, crazy, evil, and I presented alternatives instead of stupid saying uninformed. And I've got, um, if, if you can, if you know the term conjugating verbs, I am, you are, he is. If you can imagine that I, I'm talking about myself and I'm very biased and I'm gonna tend to talk about myself in the most positive terms, and the you is you are my friend. So I'm going to describe you in neutral terms or maybe just slightly negative. But the he or she or they, 
those are people that I don't know very well at all. And so I'm able to have very negative amounts of empathy towards. When we gather to disagree, I am rallying. You, my friend, are protesting. They, those bad people, they're rioting. Same, same behavior, but we're, we're conjugating the, the positive negative words and therefore conjugating the empathy that we're showing to them. When I want to tell you how right I am, I am being self-assured. You are being a little self-centered. They are being self-obsessed. When somebody is speaking out, I'm a freedom fighter. You're a rebel. They're a terrorist. When I pivot my position, well, I reconsidered. You changed your mind and they flip-flopped. And on and on it goes. An unpolished presentation. If I give an unpolished presentation, it's unstructured. If you do it, well, you're just unprepared a little bit. And if they do it, well, that's just unprofessional. And I, again, one of the handouts is a page full of these. Um, is somebody being fun at work? Are they being silly or are they being immature? If there is no other thing that comes out of this talk, if I could get you curious about slash obsessed with, as my friend Thea Rubin said, Thea, um, that... Jill and I went to, to grew up together with. Thea just texted me a half hour ago and said, I'm obsessed with these. I'm noticing all these different ways that I'm using it. And that is that just made my day. Um, we have just a few minutes left to do what should be a whole hour in itself. And that is, what do we do about all of this? And I'll tell you, one of the things I think we should do about it is to get curious to open our hearts, to, to access our calm spirits, and to nurture the health of ourselves, our relationships, and our community. And in terms of activating our curious mind, there was a fantasy world where I was going to talk about each one of these <laughs> resources. I've got links to share with you. Let me tell you very quickly, I read a book in 2016 called The Opposite of Hate by Sally Cohn. And it is an amazing book written by a very far left um, commentator that was first on M in MSNBC and she was hired by Fox News to be basically the punching bag. She went on on there all the time to be the, the token liberal that would get made fun of and, and just awful things said to her on Twitter. Well, she started reaching out to the people on Twitter that were her trolls and said, can I talk to you? And she talked to some of them and she ended up writing this entire book. She ended up going to some of the um, hottest places on the planet in terms of discord and talking to people from both sides, finding people who married somebody from the enemy group to talk about how did you come together. And she tells an amazing story. And I really highly recommend the book. Uh, Brene Brown's Braving the Wilderness. Uh, I just come back to that so often. Common enemy intimacy is a term I picked up from her when we bond over how awful the other side is, it's a form of bonding that has a lot of cost. And she calls it common enemy intimacy. And The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt, we're gonna sneak, uh, sneak in a quote of his, but he um, did some research. He pissed off a lot of liberals. He's pissed off a lot of conservatives. And I, in generally, if you're pissing off both sides, I'm like, ooh, tell me more. It might be that I don't agree with what you have to say, but I'm kind of curious. And he talks about the moral matrix. He, he, he did some fascinating research as far back as I think he was doing a lot of his stuff in the early 2000s because he was seeing the rising, the, the, what he thought was a dangerous rise in affect, affective polarization before most people did. So he did his PhD research, identified moral codes, um, and has, has a lot to say that I think a lot of us need to hear about. Yes, I know time is going. Stop yelling at me. Braver Angels and Starts With Us. Again, if there's one thing you get out of this, if you go Google them and get on their mailing list, I get weekly emails from Starts With Us that have cogent articles that calmly um, dispel a lot of myths. They're doing original research. They're finding other research out there. Braver Angels is a group that brought together the red and the blue and not to agree, but learn how to disagree better. And... Uh, I have found attending their workshops in person, a lot of neighbor, a lot of communities have Braver Angels chapters, attending their online workshops. I'm going to show you one thing that I learned from them that has changed how I have conversations around these issues. And there's tons of good podcasts. Let me tell you, 
if you love J.K. Rowling, if you are so upset at some things J.K. Rowling did or said, regardless of where you're at with that, The Witch Tiles of J.K. Rowling is a seven-episode podcast that I promise you, if you watch, listen to all of the episodes, you cannot help but think differently, feel differently, and do differently. You might respect and like her more. You might respect or like her less. You will think about the issues that have happened with J.K. Rowling over the past several years, um, and I highly recommend it. Um, and the open hearts is really about finding ways to spend more time with your side in ways that are not using common enemy um, intimacy, learning how I, again, um, one of the online workshops that I, that they put on, I think pretty much every month, Braver Angels talks about depolarizing within, and it's a little bit about within yourself and it's a lot within your party. Um, within your tribe, within the people that you talk with, because you can have more of an impact on them than you can on the other side. Mm -hmm. And if we tamp down the temperature a little bit on both sides, we're going to end up in, in a better place with this, I promise. Um, the Calm Spirits, it is not only possible to be able to access your Calm Spirit, it is essential. And a lot of us need to practice our mindfulness but also, I think what has helped me is zooming out and seeing the big picture as often as possible. I am very concerned about climate change. I am very concerned about decisions we're making. I have to zoom out to the level where I know 100% this, this planet is going to be just fine. We may not be able to live mm. here. It may be true that a nuclear war is going to happen and is going to wipe out all of humanity and all of everything, and it's going to be awful for millions of years. But I know in the life of this planet, it will end up being a blip. And our planet will find a way, because nature finds a way, to, to, to cleanse itself of the mess we made, and it will start again. Now, I that doesn't mean I'm not going to get as as active as I can to try to help as many people understand that we can make choices today that improve the, the planet for tomorrow. And I can stay calm and have those discussions and I can make choices. Um, oh, another thing, gosh, I never found a place for in this conversation is the difference between hypo hypocrisy and inconsistency. And to some degree, I guess it would be a form of conjugation. But very often we call the other side hypocritical when it's far more accurate and more useful to say they're being inconsistent. They have, com they have competing uh, values that are getting in the way from them acting on this one value because they, they also have this other belief. So many times you'll hear people say, well, supposedly they, they are okay with government involvement, then why don't they want this? Well, because there's another value getting in the way. Well, that side doesn't want any government. How come they can then turn around and say this and have this law? Well, because it's complex and because they have values here and values here. And sometimes um, they cause us to think, act, and, and feel uh, in ways that are inconsistent with our highest beliefs because we're human. And nurturing the health of our relationships Can't hear your, your microphone just. He was ready. He was. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, yep. indeed. So here, perfect example. God did that for me because that was a perfect example. On my checklist is put in fresh batteries before the talk. The problem is I end up going through a lot more batteries when I do that and good batteries get set aside. So I keep this out and I end up having a blank spot in the middle of my presentation because I have this value of, I want to protect the environment. And it's like, which one do I do? I, I read, I finished reading Jonathan Haidt. It binds us, morality binds and blinds. It binds us into ideological teams that fight each other as though the fate of the world depended on our side winning each and every battle. 
It blinds us to the fact that each team is composed of good people who have something important to say. It is, oh, emotional ba baggage, Beth, that's a good point. Um, that doesn't mean morality is bad. That doesn't mean you should throw away your morals. That one of the things that's really hard is when we're not talking about moral relativism. Oh, well, he believes that, she believes that. No, it's okay to feel strongly about things. It's how we look at the other side that's getting us into so much trouble. And the last piece here is a listening model that Braver Angels came up with where listening is emphasized, acknowledging what the other person emphasized. And if you've ever taken a peer counseling class or you were an RA or anything, you've heard of that. The thing that I got most out of this model, listen, acknowledge, pivot, and then share your perspective is the pivot stage is where after you've earned the right by listening and acknowledging, you pivot by asking permission. I've got a different take on it if you'd like to hear it. And if you can't get them to say, yes, I want to hear it, then it's not going to be useful even if you jam it in. And yes, it might be, have been a waste of your time because they weren't interested in hearing something else. But very often, if somebody feels heard and feels acknowledged, they are more than willing to hear your side of it. And, and the thing that I learned that I was doing wrong with some people who I'm on their side in the issue, but I don't like how they're saying it, I don't like their behavior, is that I'm not listening, I'm not finding the agreement point, and I'm not acknowledging before I attempt to pivot. And that, I'm, I think of myself as a good communicator, even though I can't end a presentation on time, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. We started with Amanda Gorman. I want to end with Mr. Rogers. The older I get, he wrote, the more convinced I am that the space between people who are trying their best to understand each other is hollowed ground. We've covered a lot of ground. I think of this talk as a buffet that you might want to listen to the recording again, look at your notes, look at the resource guides. I am positive that there is reason for hope that we can think better, that we can feel better, and that we can do better if we activate our curious minds, our open heart, and our calm spirit while we nurture the health of ourselves, our relationships, and our communities. Thank you for watching this or listening to it. <laughs>